Hello, and welcome back to Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner, where I read plays, poems, or whatever's currently striking my fancy at the moment. Today, we're going to be reading Easter, a play in three acts by August Strindberg, written in 1901. The characters are Mrs. Heist, Ellis, her son, a schoolmaster, Eleonora, her daughter, Christina, Ellis's fiance, Benjamin, a pupil at the grammar school, and Lindquist. The whole play takes place inside the glass veranda of a house in a small university town in the south of Sweden, furnished as the living room of a middle-class family. In the center of the back wall is the front door leading into a garden, with a fence and a gate to the street. Across the street, which, like the house, is on a height, can be seen another low fence round a garden sloping down to the town. The trees in this garden are breaking into leaf, and beyond them are a church tower and the imposing gable of a house. In the street is a lamp post with an incandescent lamp. The glass windows of the veranda, stretching across the back and two sides of the stage, are hung with curtains of a pale yellow flowery material which can be drawn. On one side of the front door hangs a mirror with a calendar below it. There are two other doors, one leading to the kitchen, the other to the rest of the house. The furniture consists of a big porcelain stove with mica panes, a dining table, a sideboard, a large writing table on which stand books, writing materials and a telephone, and a sewing table, armchairs, lamps, etc. Act 1. Maundy Thursday. Musical Prelude. Haydn. The Seven Words of the Redeemer. Introduction. Maestoso Adagio. A shaft of sunlight falls across the room, reaching one of the armchairs by the sewing table. In the other chair, out of the sun, sits Christina, threading a tape through a pair of freshly ironed white curtains. Ellis enters, leaving the front door open. He is wearing his winter overcoat, unbuttoned, and carries a bundle of papers. He and Christina greet one another affectionately. Ellis. My dear. Christina. Ah, Ellis, here you are. Ellis flings down the papers and they embrace. Then, as he takes off his coat, he gazes round the room in delight. Ellis, double windows have been taken down. Oh, and the floor has been scrubbed and fresh curtains put up. Yes, it's spring again. They have hacked up ice in the street, and down by the river the willows are in leaf. Yes, it's spring again. And I can put away my winter coat. He waves the coat in his hands, and his mood quickly changes to bitterness. Look how heavy it is. As if it had soaked up all the hardships of winter. The sweat of anguish, the dust of school. He throws the coat down on a chair. Christina, soothing him. But now you have a holiday. Yes, the Easter holiday. Five glorious days to make the most of... To breathe. And forget. He takes her hands, and they sit down together. Look, the sun has come back. It went away in November. I remember the very day when it disappeared over there behind the brewery. Ah, what a winter. What an endless winter. Don't worry, my dear. I'm going to be quite calm. It's just that I'm so glad it's over. And this good sun. He springs up. I want to wash myself in sunshine. I want to bathe myself in light after all this filth and darkness. Christina, glancing anxiously towards the kitchen. Hush, Ellis, hush. Ellis, recovering. But you know, I really believe peace is on the way. That our misfortunes are wearing themselves out at last. Christina. What makes you think that? Well, partially because just now as I was passing the cathedral, a white dove came flying by. It swooped down to the pavement and dropped the twig it was carrying in its beak right at my feet. Do you see what kind of twig it was? I suppose it couldn't really have been an olive branch. But I feel sure it was a sign of peace. And now at this moment I feel such a saving sunlit calm. Where is mother? In the kitchen. Ellis, reassured, closes his eyes, smiles, and speaks softly and happily. I hear that it is spring. I hear that the double windows have been taken out. Do you know what tells me? First, the creaking of the cartwheels. And now what's that? A 
chatter of the chaffinch. And there's hammering in the shipyard. And there's a smell of paint. The red lead paint they're using for the steamers. Christina, can you get all that here? Here? He opens his eyes and his smile fades. Yes. True enough, we are. Here. But I was there, far away up north where our home is. Why did we ever come to this odious town where people all hate each other? And one is always lonely. Yes, it was to get our daily bread, but the bread was spread with calamities. With father's crime and my little sister's sickness. Do you know if mother got permission to see father in prison? As a matter of fact, I believe she was there today. What did she say about it? Not a word. She talked about other things. All the same, something has been achieved. After the verdict, there was an end of suspense. There was even a kind of strained calm once the papers had dropped the subject. And now one year is over. In another year, he will be out. And then we can make a new start. I admire your patience and suffering. Don't. Don't admire anything about me. For I am nothing but faults. Now you know. And you'll have to believe me. It's not as if it were your own fault you're suffering for. It's other people's. What's that you're making? Curtains for the kitchen, dear. They look like a bridal veil. In the autumn, Christina, you will be my bride. Yes. But we have the summer to look forward to first. Ellis, excited. Yes, the summer. He fetches his bank book from the writing table and shows it to her. Look how much money I have saved up already. As soon as term is over, we will set up for the north. For our own country, for the Mailer Lake. The cottage stands there waiting. Just as it was when we were children. The lime trees are there, and the boat moored under the willows. Ah, oh, that it was summer now, and I could bathe in the lake. This family disgrace has smeared me all over. Body and soul, so that I pine for the lake to wash myself in. Have you heard it all from your sister? Yes. Poor little Elnora. She's miserable, and she writes letters to make my heart bleed. Naturally, she begs to be let out and allowed to come home. But you see, the principal of the institution dare not let her go, because she does things which might land her in prison. All the same, I sometimes feel conscience-stricken for having given my consent for her to be shut up there. You blame yourself for everything, dearest. But surely, as things were, it was a mercy to have her properly taken care of. Poor little thing. You are very right. And I know very well how much better things are this way. Yes, she is as well off there as she could possibly be anywhere. And when I think of the shadow she threw over any glimmer of happiness when she was here, of how our condition weighed on us like a nightmare, tormenting us past bearing. I am selfish enough to feel such release that it is almost happiness. The worst misfortune I can imagine at this moment would be to see her coming through that door. <sighs> what a wretch I am! How human you are! But all the same, I am tormented. Tormented by the thought of her misery and my father's. It's as if some people were born to suffering. Poor you. To come into a family doomed from the beginning. <laughs> and damned. Alice, you can't tell whether all this is a punishment or just a kind of test. I don't know what it can be for you. You, of all people, are free from guilt. Well, there's a saying. Tears in the morning. Laughter at eve. Dearest, perhaps I can help you to get Do through. you think Mother has a clean white tie for me? Are you going out? Yes. You know, Peter presented his thesis yesterday, and tonight he's giving a dinner to celebrate getting his doctor's degree. Do you want to go to it? You mean I ought to stay away, considering what an ungrateful pupil he's turned out to be? I admit I'm shocked by his disloyalty, promising to quote your words and then lifting whole passages from it without acknowledgement. Oh, that's always the way. And I get a certain satisfaction from knowing it's really my own work. Has he invited you? Come to think of it, he hasn't. <laughs> That's really most extraordinary. For he's been talking about this dinner for years. As if I were certain to be there. 
And I've talked about it too to other people. If now I'm not invited, it's a public insult. No matter. It's not the first I've had, nor will it be the last. Benjamin's late. Do you think he'll have passed? I certainly hope so. With a credit in Latin? He's a nice boy, Benjamin. Uncommonly nice. Although, he does rather brood over things. Christina, I suppose you know why he is living here with us. Is it because... Because, as in the case of so many others, my father embezzled the money that was in trust for the boy. That's what's so horrible, Christina. In school, I have seen all these fatherless children whom my father robbed, and who now have the humiliation of being charity pupils. And you can imagine how they look at me. I have to go on reminding myself of the miserable plight that they are in so as to forgive their cruelty. I believe your father is really better off than you are. Undoubtedly. Alice, we must think of the summer, and not of the past. Yes, of the summer. Do you know, last night I was woken up by the students singing that song that goes, Yes, I am coming. Happy winds, go tell the earth, tell the birds I love them. Tell the birches and the limes, the mountains and the lakes, I long to see them once again. To see them as when I was a child. Shall I see them once again? Shall I ever escape from this dreadful town? From Ebal, the mountain of curses, and behold Garrison once more? Christina. Yes. Yes, you will. But even then, shall I see my birches and limes as I saw them when I was a child? Won't the same black veil cling to them that clings to all nature, that has clung to life itself ever since that day? He breaks off and points to the armchair, which is now in shadow. Look, the sun is gone. It will come again, and next time it will stay longer. That's true. The days are lengthening, and the shadows growing shorter. We are moving towards the light, Alice. Believe me. Sometimes I do believe it. When I think of past days and compare them with these now, I am happy. Last year you were not sitting there. You had left me. You had broken off our engagement. You know, for me that was the darkest time of all. I literally died bit by bit. But when you came back, I came to life again. Why did you go away? Christina shakes her head. Can't you remember? No, I don't remember. It seems now as if there was no real reason. I just felt I was being told to go. And so I went as if I was walking in my sleep. When I saw you again, I woke up and was happy. And now we will never part again. If you left me now, I really should die. Here's Mother. Don't say anything. Let her go on living in her world of illusion, believing that father is a martyr and all the victims are swindlers. Mrs. Heist comes in from the kitchen, wearing an apron and peeling an apple. She speaks in a kindly, absent-minded way. Mrs. Heist. Good evening, children. Would you like your applesauce cold or hot? Cold, mother dear. That's right, my son. You always know what you want and say so. You can't do that, Christina. Ellis learned it from his father. He always knew what he wanted and what he was about. People can't stand that, and so things went badly for him. But his day will come, when he will be proved right and the others wrong. Now, wait a minute. What was it I wanted to tell you? Oh, yes. Have you heard that Linkvist is back in town? The greatest swindler of them all? Ellis agitated. He has come here? Yes. He's living just across the street. Then we're bound to see him passing every day. <laughs> that too. Just let me have a word with him. And he'll never show his face again, for I know a thing or two about him. Well, Ellis, how did Peter get on with his thesis? Very well. I can quite believe that. And when are you going to present your thesis? When I can afford to, Mother. When I can afford to. That's no answer. And Benjamin? Has he got through his exam? We don't know yet. But he'll be in soon. 
I see. You know, I'm not quite sure I like that Benjamin. He goes around giving himself airs as if he had some claims on us. But we'll cure him of that. He's a nice boy, really. Oh yes, there's a parcel for you, Ellis. She goes out of the kitchen. Mrs. Heist, coming in and handing Ellis a parcel. Here it is. Lena took it in. I'm going back to the kitchen. She looks anxiously at the front door, as if fearing an intruder. Isn't it too cold with that door open? No, no. Not at all, Mother. Ellis, you shouldn't leave your overcoat there. It looks so untidy. Well, Christina, are my curtains nearly ready? Christina. Yes, Mother, in just a few minutes. Mrs. Heist. You know, I like that, Peter. He's rather a favorite of mine. Aren't you going to his dinner, Alice? Yes. Yes, what? Why, certainly, of course. Why did you say you wanted your applesauce cold if you're going out? You're so vague, Alice. But Peter isn't. Shut the door if there's a draft, so you don't catch cold. She goes out to the kitchen. Ellis. Poor dear mother. And it's always Peter. What's her idea? Is she trying to tease you about Peter? Me. Well, you know the queer notions old women get. What is your present? Ellis opens the parcel and slowly draws out a bundle of birch twigs tied together. A Lenten birch. Who's it from? It doesn't say. Well, it's harmless enough. I shall put it in water and it will blossom like Aaron's rod. (laughs) Then suddenly he cuts the air with it and speaks cynically. Birch. As when I was a child. And as for limes. Lindquist. A twig of lime has come here. Why does it matter so much? Ellis, laying down the birch. We owe him more money than all the rest. But surely you don't owe him anything. We do. We are all in this together. The family name is dishonored so long as one debt remains. Change your name. Christina. Thank you, Ellis. I only wanted to test you. But you mustn't tempt me. Then Kivist is a poor man. He needs what belongs to him. Wherever my father went, the place became like a battlefield strewn with dead and wounded. Yet my mother believes he is the victim. Would you like to come for a walk? And find the sun? With all my heart. Ellis, thinking it out. Do you understand this, Christina? The Redeemer suffered for our sins, yet we have to go on paying. No one is paying for me. But if someone were paying for you, would you understand then? Yes, of course. Then I should understand. Here comes Benjamin. Can you see if he's looking cheerful? Christina, looking out. He's walking very slowly. And now he's stopping at the fountain and bathing his eyes. That too. Wait a little. Tears. Tears, be patient. Benjamin comes in. Polite but sad. He is carrying some books and a satchel. Alice. Well, how did the Latin go? Benjamin. Badly. May I see your notes? What went wrong? I used oot with the indicative where I knew it should be the subjective. Then you're done for. But what on earth made you do such a thing? Benjamin, humbly. I can't make it out. I knew how it ought to go, and I wanted to write it that way, but I I wrote it wrong. A long pause while Ellis looks through the papers. Benjamin slumps down at the table. Ellis. Yes. Here it is, the indicative. Oh, Lord. Christina, to Benjamin. Well, better luck next time. Life is long, terribly long. Benjamin, bitterly. Yes, it certainly is. Ellis, sadly, but without bitterness. That everything should happen at once like this. You were my best pupil. So what can I expect of the others? 
My reputation as a teacher will be ruined. I shall get no more tutoring, and so... Well, everything's gone to pieces. Seeing Benjamin's distress. Don't take it so hard. It's not your fault. Christina, urgently. Alice, for heaven's sake, have courage. Where am I to find it? Where you found it before. This isn't the same as before. I seem to have fallen from grace. It is a sign of grace to suffer when you are innocent. Don't be tempted by impatience. Stand the test. For this is only a test. I feel sure of that. Can the year Benjamin must go through now be less than 365 days? Yes. A cheerful heart makes time go quickly. Ellis, ironically. Blow on the sore and make it better. (laughs) That's what they tell all children. Christina, to Ellis gently. Be a child then. And I'll comfort you like one. Think of your mother, how she bears it all. Ellis, give me your hand. I am sinking. Christina gives him her hand. Your hand is trembling. I don't feel it. You're not so strong as you make out. I don't, I don't feel any weakness. Then why can't you give me strength? I have none to spare. Ellis turns to the window. Pause. Look who's coming. The creditor. Christina, looking out of the window too. This is too much. The creditor. The man who can take all our furniture, everything we own, whenever he pleases. Linkovist, who has come here to sit like a spider in the center of his web and watch the flies. Christina, catching hold of him and pointing to the kitchen. Go away. No, I won't. Just now when you grew weak, I grew strong. Now he's coming up the street. He has already cast his evil eye on his prey. At least keep out of his sight. No. Now I will find him amusing. He seems to be gloating over his quarry caught in the trap. Come on, my friend. He's measuring the distance to the gate. He sees by the open door that we are home. But now he's met someone. He's stopping to talk. They're talking about us. He's glancing this way. So long as he doesn't meet Mother. If she gives him the sharp edge of her tongue, there'll be no hope at all. Don't let that happen, Alice. Now he's shaking his stick, as if to declare that in this case mercy shall not take the place of justice. He's unbuttoning his overcoat to show that at least we've left him the clothes he stands up in. I can see by his lips what he's saying. What shall I answer? Sir, you are right. Take everything it belongs to you. That's all you can say. Now he's laughing. Pause. But it's a kind laugh, not a cruel one. Perhaps he's not so cruel after all. Even if he does want his money. I wish he'd come on in and stop that blessed chatter. Now he's waving his stick again. They always have sticks, those creditors that come in to dun you and galoshes that go swish, swish, like a cane through the air. He holds Christina's hand against his heart. Feel how my heart is pounding. There's a throbbing in my right ear like an ocean liner. Ah, now he's saying goodbye. And here comes the galoshes. Swish, swish like the Lenten birch. But he has a watch chain with trinkets dangling from it. So he's not quite destitute. They always wear trinkets made of cornelian, like chunks of flesh cut off their neighbors' backs. Listen to the galoshes. Swish, swish, beast, beasts, hard, harder, harder. Swish, swish. Look out. He's seen me, he's seen me. Bows towards the street. He bowed to me first. He's smiling. He's waving his hand and... He has gone the other way. He collapses at the writing table. Christina. Thank God. He's gone away. But he will come again. Long pause. Let us go out into the sun. But what about Peter's dinner? As I haven't been invited, I'm not going. Anyhow, what have I to do with people celebrating? Why go to meet a disloyal friend? I should suffer just the same, but blame it all on him. So you're going to stay at home with us? Oh, thank you. You know very well that's what I want to do. 
Shall we go? Christina. Yes. This way. She goes out to the kitchen. Ellis begins to follow her, but stops to pick up the birch. As he passes Benjamin, he puts a hand on his head. Ellis. Courage, boy. Benjamin hides his face. Ellis puts the birch behind the mirror. Sadly. It was no olive branch that dove brought, but a birch. He goes out. The Haydn is heard from the church. Eleonora comes in from the street. She looks about sixteen, has her hair in plaits, and wears the plain dress of an institution. She carries a yellow daffodil in a pot. Without seeming to see Benjamin, she puts the daffodil on the sideboard and waters it. Then she moves the flower to the dining table, sits down opposite Benjamin, watches him and mimics his movements. He looks up at her in amazement. Eleonora, pointing to the daffodil. Do you know what that is? Benjamin, boyishly. Of course I do. It's a daffodil. But who are you? Eleanor echoes sadly and gently. Yes. Who are you? I'm called Benjamin, and I'm born here at Mrs. Heist's. I see. I'm called Eleonora, and I'm the daughter of the house. How queer. They've never talked about you. One doesn't talk about the dead. The dead? Eleonora. In the eyes of the world, I am dead, for I've done something very wicked. You? Yes, I embezzled trust funds. Of course, that doesn't matter very much, for uh, ill-gotten gains never prosper. But my old man was blamed for it and put in prison, and that, you see, can never be forgiven. How strangely and beautifully you speak. It never occurred to me that my inheritance might have been ill-gotten. Eleanor, we should not bind people but set them free. Yes, you have set me free from the shame of feeling myself cheated. So you're being brought up by guardians, too? Yes. It's my miserable fate to be kept here by these unhappy people, serving as sentence for their crime. You mustn't use hard words, or I shall go away. I am so soft I can't bear anything hard. But you, are you bearing all this because of me? Because of your father. It's all in one. For he and I are one and the same person. I have been very ill. Why are you so sad? Oh, I've had rather a blow. Why be sad about that? The rod and reproof give wisdom, and he that hateth correction shall die. What was the blow? I failed in my Latin exam, when I was absolutely sure I'd get through. I see. So sure, so cocksure that you'd even have bet your pocket money on it. Yes. I did. I thought so. Don't you see it happened like that just because you were so sure? Do you think that was the reason? Of course it was. Pride goes before a fall. Benjamin, smiling. Well, I, I, I'll remember that next time. Good. And a sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. Benjamin, boyishly. Are you religious? Yes. I am religious. Really? A believer, I mean. Yes, that's what I mean. So if you say anything bad about God, who is my friend, I won't sit at the same table with you. How old are you? For me, there's neither time nor space. I'm everywhere of all times. I am in my father's prison and in my brother's schoolroom, and in my mother's kitchen and in my sister's shop far away in America. When sales are good, I share her joy. When they aren't, I'm sorry. But not so sorry as when she does something bad. Benjamin? You are called Benjamin because you are the youngest of my friends. Yes, all human beings are my friends. Benjamin, if you trust yourself to me, I will suffer for you too. I, I don't really understand your words, but, but I seem to know what you mean all the same. And so I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to. And to begin with, stop judging people. 
even those who are convicted of sin. Y- yes, but I must have a reason for that. You see, I-, I studied philosophy. Oh, have you? Then you can help me to understand these words of a great philosopher. He says, He who hateth the righteous shall himself become a sinner. By all the laws of logic, that means that man can be foredoomed to sin, and the sin itself is punishment. That's really deep. One can take it for Kant or Schopenhauer. Where did you read that? In the Holy Scriptures. Really? Are there things like that in them? How ignorant you are! You've been neglected. If only I could bring you up. Benjamin, laughing. (laughs) You're very sweet. But it's clear there's something bad in you. In fact, you look very good to me. What was the name of your Latin master? Dr. Algren. I shall remember that. Pause. Then she gets up and cries out in agony. Oh, now my father is in great trouble. They're being cruel to him. She stands still, listening. Do you hear how the telephone wires are wailing? That's because of the hard words the beautiful soft red copper can't bear. When people speak ill of one another on the telephone, the copper wails and wails. And every word is written in the book. And at the end of time will come the reckoning. Benjamin. How stern you are. I? Oh no. How would I dare be? I? (laughs) I? Her mood changes. She becomes quiet and crafty. Looks round, tiptoes to the stove. Opens the door and takes out several torn up pieces of white notepaper. Benjamin goes over to watch as she pieces the letter together on the sewing table. How careless people are, leaving their secrets in stoves. Wherever I am, I go straight to the stove, but I never misuse anything I find. I wouldn't dare. If I did, something awful would happen to me. Now, what's this? Reads. Benjamin. It's Mr. Peeting writing to Christina to ask her to meet him. I've been expecting this for some time. Eleanor, putting her hand over the papers. Oh, you, what have you been expecting? You wicked creature, always thinking the worst of people. This letter has nothing but good in it. I know, Christina, she is going to be my sister-in-law. This meeting will prevent a misfortune to my brother Ellis. Benjamin, will you promise not to say a word about this? I wouldn't dare talk about it. It's wrong of people to have secrets. They think themselves wise and are fools. She gathers up the pieces and puts them back in the stove. Now what made me do that? Benjamin. Yes, why are you so inquisitive? You see, that's my sickness. I must know everything. I can't rest until I do. Benjamin. Know everything? Eleanor, sadly. Yes. It's a fault I can't overcome. Anyhow, I know what the starlings say. Can they talk? Haven't you heard of starlings being taught to speak? Yes, taught. Well then, they can learn. And there are some that teach themselves. They sit and listen, without our knowing, of course, and then they mimic us. Just now, as I came along, I heard a couple chatting in the walnut tree. What fun you are! What do they say? Well, one said, Peter, and the other one said, Judas! Much of a muchness, said the first. Five, 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 said the second. And have you noticed that the only place the nightingales sing is over in the garden of the deaf and dumb? Because those who have hearing don't hear what the nightingales say. But the deaf and dumb people do hear it. Pause. Benjamin. Tell me some fairy tales. I will if you're kind to me. How do you mean, kind? Well, you must never hold me to my words. Never say, then you said that, and now you say this, see? Now, I'll tell you some more about birds. There's a bad one called the rat buzzard because he feeds on rats. Because he's bad, it's made hard for him to catch them. He can only say one word, and that sounds like a cat's meow. So when the buzzard says, meow, the rats run away and hide. But the buzzard doesn't understand what he's saying, so he goes without food very often. Do you want to hear any more? Or shall I tell you about flowers? You see, when I was ill, I had to take some medicine with henbane in it. That turns your eye into a magnifying glass. Just the opposite of belladonna. 
which makes you see everything small. So now I can see further than other people. I can see the stars in daylight. The stars aren't up then. <laughs> Silly, the stars are always up. Why, at this very moment I'm sitting facing north and looking at Cassiopeia like a W in the middle of the Milky Way. Can you see it? <laughs> no, I can't. There you are. One person can see what another person can't. So don't be so cocksure. Now, I'll tell you about this flower on the table. It's a Lenten lily, and its home is in Switzerland. It has a chalice, full of sunlight, that's why it's yellow, and it has the power of soothing pain. I passed a flower shop on my way and saw it. I wanted it. To give my brother Ellis. I went up to the door, but the shop was shut. Of course, because it's confirmation day. So as I had to have the flower, I, I took out my keys and tried them. And what do you think? My latch key fitted, and I went in. Oh, if only you understood the silent language of flowers. Every scent says so many things. I was quite overwhelmed. And with my magnifying eye, I looked right into their works, which no one else sees. And they told me how they suffered at the hands of the careless gardener. I don't say cruel, for he is only thoughtless. Then I put a coin on the counter with my card, took the flower, and came away. How rash of you. Suppose they miss the flower and don't find the money. That's true. You're right. A coin gets lost so easily. And if they only find your card, you're done for. Surely no one would believe I'd just take something. Benjamin, looking hard at her. Wouldn't they? Oh, I know what you mean. Like father, like child. How thoughtless of me. Oh, well. What must be, must be. That's all there is to it. C can't we do something to put it right? Hush. Let's talk about something else. Dr. Algren. Poor Alice. Poor all of us. But this is Easter, and we must suffer. There will be the Easter concert tomorrow, won't there? They'll play hide and seven words of the Redeemer. Mother, behold thy son. She weeps. Benjamin, after a long pause. What sort of illness was it you had? My illness is not sickness unto death, but unto the honor of God. I expected good and evil came. I expected light and darkness came. What was your childhood like, Benjamin? Oh, I, I don't know. Pretty miserable. And yours? I never had one. I was born old. I knew everything when I was born. And when I learned anything, it was like... Remembering. I knew all about people, their blindness and folly, when I was four years old. That's why they were unkind to me. Everything you say I seem to have thought myself. I expect you have. What made you think the coin I left in the flower shop would get lost? Because that annoying sort of thing always does happen. So you found that too. Hush! Someone's coming in. I can hear... That is Ellis. Oh, how lovely. My one and only friend on earth. But he's not expecting me. And he won't be glad to see me. Of course he won't. Benjamin. Benjamin, be friendly and look happy when my poor brother comes in. I'll go, and you must break it to him that I'm here. But, but no hard words, remember? They hurt me so. Give me your hand. He does so, and she kisses him on the head. Now. Now you're my dear brother, too. God bless you and keep you. As she passes Ellis's overcoat, she pats the sleeve affectionately. Benjamin watches her. Poor Alice. Eleanor goes into the house. Ellis comes in from the street, looking troubled, and goes to the writing table. Before Benjamin can tell him of the arrival, Mrs. Heist enters from the kitchen. Ellis. Ah, there you are, mother. Mrs. Heist. Was that you? I thought I heard a strange voice. Ellis, I've got some news. I met our lawyer in the street. Yes? The case is going to the Court of Appeal, and to save time I've got to read through the whole report of the proceedings. He pulls some documents from a drawer. Mrs. Heist, well, that won't take you long. Oh, I thought all that was over. 
And now I have to go through it all again, the long tale of suffering with all the accusations, all the witnesses, all the evidence. The whole thing over again. Yes. But then he'll be acquitted by the Court of Appeal. No, he won't, Mother. You know he confessed. But there may be some legal error. That was the last thing the lawyer said to me. He only said it to comfort you. Oughtn't you be off to that dinner? No. Now you've changed your mind again. I know. You shouldn't do that. I can't help it. I'm tossed about like driftwood in a storm. I was quite sure I heard a strange voice that I recognized. But I must have been wrong. Points to the overcoat. That coat shouldn't be left there, as I said before. She goes out to the kitchen. Ellis, catching sight of the daffodil. To Benjamin. Where did that flower come from? Benjamin. Uh, A young lady brought it. Young lady? What's happened now? Who was it? It was... Was it... My sister? Benjamin. Yes. Ellis sits down at the table. Pause. Did you speak to her? Oh, yes. My God, is there no end to it? Did she... Behave badly. Oh, no, she was very, very nice. How extraordinary. Did she mention me? Is she she very angry with me? On the contrary, she said that you were her one and only friend on earth. What an amazing change. And when she left, she patted that coat of yours on the sleeve. Left? Where did she go? Benjamin, pointing. In there. You mean she's there now? Yes. You look so happy and friendly, Benjamin. She talks so beautifully. What did she talk about? She told me fairy tales. And then there was a lot about religion. Ellis, rising. And that made you happy? Benjamin nods. Poor Eleanor. She's so unhappy herself, and yet she can make others happy. Reluctantly, he goes towards the door to face the ordeal of meeting Eleanora. God help me.